The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this month's Vision New England free webinar series. We're really excited you were able to carve out some time and join us today. We have a great topic in mind and a fantastic speaker, and we know that God's going to bless you. Um, he, I know he has a great topic in hand for us. So before we get going, I just wanted to go through a couple of quick um, little logistics so we're all on the same page. Uh, my name is Mike Froning and I am the Director of Marketing and Communications at Vision New England. And if you have any questions, we're going to go uh, promptly from noon to 1245 with a 10 minute uh, question and answer time at the end. Uh, we will try to be as prompt as possible. And if you have any questions, I just wanted to go through a couple of quick things with our tool. You should have a nice um, menu to the right hand side of your screen and you have a couple of ways you can ask questions throughout the webinar. You don't have to wait to the end for the question and answer time. Feel free to, to type in a question as we go. Um, you have a chat function where you can type in a quick uh, question or you have the question function where you can ask a more detailed question. And if you do have a question, I'll interject quickly with our speaker and try to get an answer right away. Uh, so again, thank you. We're really excited today to have uh, Danielle Chalsma with us today. She is a, a consultant for Vision New England, but also uh, an owner of a marketing and communications company called CYA in Boston and internationally, and has over 20 years of experience in the marketing and communications realm. Uh, but she's also been involved in many uh, boards, and, and most recently, uh, the board at Free Church in uh, Andover. So we're really excited to have Danielle today, and we know that uh, you'll be blessed with her time here. And Danielle, welcome to our webinar. Hi. I, I don't see a picture, but... It's coming. I, okay. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. Um, we're going to talk about... Um, Ending Boredom, which um, is creating conditions for healthy, vibrant, and effective church boards and committees. The, um, the whole purpose of this is that I, I believe, and, and I know you believe, that God has such incredible plans for your church and to move forward in his planning. Um, in order to do that, I think we need to set ourselves up organizationally so that we can hear his voice together without all of the um, clouded information and clouded uh, relationships that happen if we're not set up organizationally healthy. Um, so let's, um, I'm going to read something for you on the next slide. It's, we all want to work in a healthy, thriving, and mutually encouraging environment where we're exhibiting the fruit of the spirit, we're using our gifts, and living the results of our effectiveness. We want to be collectively listening for God's leading at this time in the history of our particular local church. We want to turn our average boards and committees into highly thriving functioning teams. How do we get there? It, it almost sounds like utopia, but I believe um, with faith and intentional organization we can do that. So let's just, I'm going to go over four things. Uh, the webinar outline is that we're going to talk about that effective teams don't just happen. We are going to talk about asking how we will be. This is one of the most important things that we can do, is ask how we can be as a group, as a, as a group that has discussed ways in which we will interact with each other. We're going to talk about what we will do, our functional boundaries as these teams. It doesn't have to be a board. It can be any team that you have in a church or an organization. Um, today we are focusing on boards. And that the term vibrant meetings is not an oxymoron. Um, you can create meetings where boards and members actually want to join. So let's start out with the leadership team. Clearly the first thing on the list is that um, on, a, on a church board that you have Jesus followers, Timothy and Titus outline that beautifully for us. Um, and you can just follow uh, that. And also the next thing is gatekeeping. It's gathering the right people. Um, that sounds almost um, unchristian in certain examples, um, but pray for God to reveal anything that you should know about the people that you're inviting onto a team. Clearly giftedness um, and that they're emotionally healthy. It is really important that um, you lead the emotionally healthy in your church and do not be led by them. It seems like it should go without saying, but say it, know it, and choose it so that when you're picking people for your teams, you want to spend a lot of time discussing the emotional health um, of those prospective people. You want to make sure they have a solid prayer life and a family life. 
and you want to um, make sure that you have seen them in situations exhibiting emotional health as well as spiritual health. Although they're highly intertwined, um, emotional health is um, extremely important. Peter Scazzaro in his book, Emotionally Healthy Church, um, has a very brave and bold statement um, that the church will never mature beyond its leadership. Even if, even if you think that's not quite true, um, even if it's partly true, remember that everybody who comes to your meeting has a family and their own problems and um, issues in their own personal lives with work and the things. So they're not coming to you alone at every board meeting. They're coming to you with all of these things on their plate. Um, one of the most important things in this to do is to pray. Pray a lot for your team members and have them pray for themselves and pray together so that when they come there, they are able to focus on the issues at hand. Um, next thing in the leadership team is uh, alignment. And what we mean by that is that, that the people that you invite on a team are aligned with your faith, faith and vision. We don't mean uh, yes men, yes women, uh, people who will just go along with things. Um, but that they understand and agree with and are in alignment with the way that you have decided um, your church would be going. The other thing is that team must come first. Um, this does not negate uh, personal experience or even let's say um, some of the members of your team are on a representative uh, sort of capacity. They may come with information from that particular ministry or something that they're representing, but in the end that the team decision and the team must come first. So together you're collectively discerning what is best for the vision of that, uh, of that church at that time. So it's important that people understand that going in. The next thing is terms and rotations. This is very individual to churches, um, but I do want you to remember in, uh, that being called to a board is a calling by God. Um, and that he will arrange it in, within your prayers, he will arrange for people to come to your board that have been um, vetted. But you want people, as long as your church can withstand. Um, I know that many churches have had difficulties with boards, so they lo uh, lessen and lessen their terms um, and rotation so that they don't get scared about having someone too long. Um, but we're going to talk about uh, gatekeeping again later and talk about making sure putting everything into making sure that um, the people you bring onto a board are the people you want to stay there. I'm going to read something uh, from a book called uh, Sticky Teams. Uh, my favorite chapter is chapter three. Um, it's called Guarding the Gate. It's hard to have a winning team with losing players. What happens when just one contentious or negative person joins that team? Conflict avoidance, walking on eggshells. You end up with off-the-record discussions and after the meeting meetings conspire to sabotage or change everything you thought you decided the night before. At best, this leads to mediocrity. Plus, removal can be a very difficult process because even the most disruptive board members and unproductive staff members have friends and supporters. Um, it's a great chapter, it's a great book, and we'll give you the resources later, but I just wanted to talk to you about that um, to make sure that you, um, you and your team pour a lot of time into deciding what are the best terms and rotations for you. Um, vacancies are better than cancers. Again, a little bit of a, um, uh, a harsh way of saying it, but the truth is, as, as um, Sticky Teams just read out, if you have someone on the board that is contentious or difficult and they have uh, supporters in the church and it's, it, it's just going against everything that you want to do in terms of listening for God in, in your churches to decide together to discern where he wants you to go. If there's always time spent on um, dealing with a contentious person, uh, it takes a lot away from where your church could be going at any given time. Um, another thing is identifying future leaders and raising up future leaders. We don't have time to go into the details of this today, but I would, I would um, suggest that you with your team and your group and the church staff boards that you decide on a process where you're spending time investing into people who are not yet leaders or who are not yet board members but are doing other things and figure out whether they would be good at this and how to do that and have a process to identify and then also encourage and raise up for future people um, to come onto these boards. Just take a minute um, so that uh, you, you can start thinking about this in your own, whether it's a board or a team or a staff group. Um, you should rate your team 
overall, um, one being low and 10 being high on these issues. How are you doing with these things? You want to talk about one thing that you're doing really well as a team. It's always good to focus on the positive. And then even just today, if you want to write down two things uh, that your team could work on in the next few months so that you could start going toward developing um, the right people on a leadership team uh, and, and then deciding on the way that they will interact, which is our next topic, how we will be. This is by far the most important decision you will make on how, how your team will be. It, it sounds obvious, but it's a game changer. Uh, it will determine the success of accomplishing, accomplishing what God um, has set out for you instead of focusing on, uh, on interactions. So healthy leaders equal a healthy church, and you want to do that by example, so you want to have people that have shown that they interact well um, with people in the church on other committees that they've done. I uh, highly suggest that you develop a board and team covenant. Uh, there's many examples of that. We have examples of that. Um, we can send them to you. There's many online. Just to get a start of absolutely um, not assuming how people should interact with each other, but more importantly, writing down an expectation of how people will act and um, treat each other within this covenant on this uh, team. Confidentiality is really important and not secrecy. Um, and you want people to be growing disciples in Christ. You want them to be devoted to be growing, in, growing disciples of Christ on their own. The next thing of how you will be and what, how you will act is one voice. Uh, one voice communication. Again, that does not mean coming into a meeting where you would have, um, that your opinion and your experiences and your team don't matter. What, what it is is that the whole purpose of you coming to that meeting, to that board meeting with the, with the knowledge that you have or the portfolios that you represent, is that you would be pouring into a whole, and the whole is this board meeting where you will come out discerning together where God wants you to go, visioning the things he wants you to concentrate on at this time in the history of your particular church. It's really important um, that each member understands they are to act in the um, best interest of the church with love and respect and to value each called member. Um, having each other's backs outside of the boardroom, extremely important. Again, what this means is it doesn't matter whether or not people agreed specifically within the meeting and they may still be, um, I'll even say, duking things out at the board level in a meeting. However, when you leave that room, the board is a team a team of people who support each other with grace and mercy and kindness and through this covenant so that when, you know, as will happen in your churches when you go out, uh, you know, into the um, coffee ship, co fellowship or coffee hour after um, services or at meetings, people will start to talk about other people and it is best and more cohesive for a team and to discern God's will when they are protecting each other and they're saying, actually, if you have a problem, with so-and-so, then you direct them directly back to that person instead of talking to them um, about someone else. So really, the board should understand that it is part of their job to thwart any triangling that would go on in a church so that people pe feel protected, they feel safe, and they will be able to share their ideas freely. Um, no surprises, communication. Uh, this is something that has come up in a couple of churches I've worked with. Um, Mostly this is from the pastors and the leaders where you don't want to come to a meeting and announce something or that there's this great big problem and nobody knew about it beforehand. That when things are going to change, uh, when decisions are going to be made, that they're communicated to the board, through the board, so that when they happen and a board member gets um, a question asked at, at a service or in the rotunda after, that they actually know what's happening, they knew it was going to happen, and again, whether they agree with it um, or not on that particular day or during the meeting, that they would understand all of the issues around it so that no one's caught um, unknowing. No days communication. Um, the most important thing about this is when you're working as a board or a staff, so many people come and say, they, meaning a bunch of people in the church don't like the music, don't like the, the way things are going, don't like the direction. Um, if you don't allow 
uh, very clearly in your church anybody to be considered a they, and you don't take any comments, requests, um, or complaints without a name attached, it thwarts a lot of the problems that exist when you have factions of people, just regular interactions of people, uh, the way they communicate. And this stops that, and it allows people to uh, respectfully and um, forthrightly bring complaints or concerns or ideas uh, instead of doing a they thing where it really has no, um, there's no traction to that. It just creates a lot of angst. Us and them, communication between board and staff. Um, any of you on a board, I'm sure this has um, come up before. I would say the pastor, the chair, and some of the um, executive staff uh, could take this on in terms of making sure that the communication between board and staff is not an us and them, but it is indeed a we, that board and staff are in the same direction, have the same strategies and, and visioning for this church, for the church that you're in at that time. And so it's, it takes a lot of work for the pastor, the chair, and, and upper end staff to make sure that they are in constant communication and on the same page so it doesn't start to feel like an us and them, especially when the board has a jurisdiction over their uh, firing and hiring. Still, in terms of moving ahead and discerning God's will, you can be a team with the board and the staff. Vulnerability is a must, uh, and the leader must model it. Let's first talk about what vulnerability isn't. It is not using the team as a personal therapy session. Um, it, is, it is not about your personal problems at all. What it is about is honest, transparent, and comfortable, almost being um, naked emotionally with respect to the things that are going on in the church and with respect to things that um, that the person themselves might have difficulty with. So being vulnerable um, is uh, abandoning self-focused pride and fear for the good of the organization. So be willing to say where you've failed, where you're nervous, where you need support. Um, the team members to be vulnerable in that way will create an atmosphere where it's actually okay to fail. It's actually okay to not know where to go next and that people will come around you and support you. But if the leader is um, hiding this or the, the leader is one who is trying to create an image, this would, this would create a problem for the team. Conflict, uh, clearly healthy conflict resolution is uh, very important. Conflict is about issues and ideas. So there's many resources out there. Peacemakers is one of them, but there are many others that teach people how to uh, resolve conflict in a healthy way. Conflict is never fun. Um, it can be dangerous, but if people are taught and learned and practice how to resolve conflict in a healthy way, interacting with each other um, with rules, with actual rules of, of interacting, like never talking about someone's character in the conflict, but more about the issues at hand. Uh, it, it helps a lot in terms of the issues that are going to come up at a board level or an executive staff level at any church. Now accountability, um, different than conflict and, and vulnerability, is about performance and behavior. It's not a four-letter word. It's actually an excellent thing for a team to agree to be willingly accountable to each other so that there's great freedom. You know, I, I remember b before I became Christian, um, I, I remember thinking that there was a lack of freedom in following God's rules. There was, there was going to be a lack of freedom. I wasn't going to be able to be myself. I was going to have to follow this list. And as, as you know, as, as Christians, that the truth of it is there's such incredible freedom in following um, God's laws and God's plan for your life, incredible freedom to be who you were meant to be. The same is with accountability. Um, having the courage, what accountability is, is having the courage to confront someone about their deficiencies, performance and behavior, then standing in the moment and dealing with their reaction which may not be pleasant. So in effect, accountability is caring enough about someone to risk having them blame you for holding them accountable in the first place. Again, we'll give, give you some resources at the end. This particular quote came from Patrick Lencioni, which is a secular book called The Advantage, excellent uh, book on organizational health and how that all plays out. Hey, Danielle, quick question. Yes. 
Who sure. is who is the author of the book Peacemakers? Oh. Do you know? I will get that after. I don't off the top of my head. I do have it in a bookcase that I'm no, I can't be attached to at the moment, but I I'll have. S- it. I'll see what I can do. Okay. Thank you. Willing accountability. I mean, one of the things that I've been on two boards with um, a handful of pastors, and often uh, pastors have difficulty with accountability, and and I understand because they may have been with boards that have had difficult times. But the truth is, if a pastor is willing to be accountable as the leader, as, as the one who sets the example, willing to be accountable to the job description and the understanding, there is such incredible freedom that he or she has in terms of doing that job, in terms of having and taking the time to spend a discipling and mentoring a certain group of people, or praying, spending time on the job at work, praying, or playing guitar in their office to, to meditate before they write their sermons. If, if we are um, understanding that accountability is a positive thing and that everybody is under it because we are all God's people, and we are accountable to God first and each other, it's a very freeing thing. It's not as negative as, as it sometimes has from both the church world and the secular world. People are often afraid of accountability. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is in terms of how we will be, how we will act as a team, is retreats, extended, having extended time together. Now, it doesn't matter if they're uh, day-long retreats or weekend retreats or overnight or not. The idea is to schedule a couple times a year for these um, high-level functioning teams to go on retreat together, spend some time, extended prayer together, um, visioning together. It's really important, which, you know, in the daily grind of things, as you know, either in your workplace or on your boards, you get waylaid by things, um, and the retreats allow that time to connect as a team, to connect with God, and to realign yourselves um, into the vision that, that, that God has set for your particular church at this particular time. Uh, the other thing is so many churches, small groups, uh, we know that um, small groups are excellent for connection and prayer and uh, people finding Jesus and getting close to Jesus. And I've had experiences where on the board itself or on a, an executive level staff team, they actually create a small group. So they're living what they're preaching, so to speak, where they would choose to be a small group, and I don't know if they're meeting once a week or once a month, whatever is going to work for your team, but as a board, if you meet as a small group and you decide to read a book, or, uh, and not, not a book that, has, that is about um, leading, we're talking um, a Bible study book or a book of the Bible, or um, we have shared testimonies. I've been in experiences where we've spent a long time sharing our testimonies and what that could mean for each other and feeding into each other's lives as a small group, not only as a leadership team. Spiritual direction is a great thing um, to do and to uh, enact and invite for the leaders in your team, be it uh, your staff members, executive staff, again, or board, where you would invite a spiritual director into, the, into one of your meetings and do group spiritual direction to make sure that people are um, soul searching and going deep in their prayer lives. Uh, you have a line item on your budget even for that to say that you know how important it is to pour into the lives of the people that are, that are leading. So um, it, it's something that you want to have at the outset and, and, and in your budget and be open and honest about it that you, there's payment for this usually, so that that is another good way to, to choose how you will be with your particular staff, knowing that everybody is focusing on their own spiritual growth. Next in the list is what we will do. Um, this is about functional boundaries and clarity. Uh, it helps keep a team focused on what they should be doing and what they should not be doing. Uh, this takes a lot of competitiveness and practice. So once you've decided on your functional boundaries, what the team is to do, I'm just going to read a list here for you. Are you approving team? Are you guiding? Are you managing? Are you advising? It is really important for any team that is gathered, and it will be different in different churches who have deacons or elders or their congregationalism. Each will have a different list of what they should be focusing on. But it is really important to list them, get them down, 
um, and super important to repeat to each other, to the congregation, to the staff, repeat over and over what the team's functional boundaries and scope are. Live them, protect them, and repeat it. So even during your meetings, um, this would be mostly the responsibility um, of the chair and the pastor, but anybody could chime in and say, you know, I think we've actually gone down a rabbit trail where we're focusing on either minutia or something that, that isn't our job to do, and someone can write that down and hand it to the right people, but it takes a while to learn how to function, how to uh, focus on the things that you said you wanted to focus on that you agreed as a team that would help with the visioning of, of your church. Danielle, we had a quick question for you. Sure. In your experience, I wonder if you could comment about the usage or and or development of a recusal policy or a policy that um, kind of guides and directs a board when some sort of a personal issue or some sort of a conflict would arise with a board member. Um, um, amongst the board members? Correct. So if you had uh, some sort of a hot issue that maybe somebody had an economic interest that could excuse themselves from the discussion, something to that effect. I'm not sure I understand the question. It, a conflict amongst the board members, we, we had originally talked about covenant, and in your covenant you could certainly have ways um, that you will decide on how you deal with conflict amongst the members, but you mentioned something financial. What was that? Yeah, I guess the question is more if there's a, um, if there's a topic you're discussing and there's a personal conflict of interest. So in other words, if I'm involved in economic development and we're deciding that on a new building of a church, I might want to remove myself from the discussion as a board member because I have a personal interest in the discussion. I would imagine I, I haven't uh, had that a personal experience with that, however, um, within your elder covenant, within your agreement of how you will be, would be for someone to to let that be known. It would be an expectation for any member of a team to let it be known when there is indeed a conflict of interest. And it would be also, another idea would be acceptable that the team, if someone doesn't recognize the conflict of interest themselves, that the team would be at liberty to call them out and say, is that, and then to discuss it, and then somebody could be um, excused from that particular discussion. Fantastic. Does that answer it? Thank you, yes. Okay. Um, all right. Patrick Lencioni is um, an author that wrote, I will show you quick, um, The Advantage. It is an excellent resource. Um, why organizational health trumps everything else in business. Another extremely bold statement. Um, but when you read the book, it makes total sense, and this is where um, he really talks about the leader being vulnerable and, and leading the pack on how to be in order to achieve the goals you want to achieve and how one can't happen well without the other. Um, he starts with uh, creating clarity, being very, very clear on who you are, what you will do, and what you won't do, which is the functional boundaries we spoke about. Six questions. Why do we exist? How do we behave? What do we do? How will we succeed, which is the strategy? Uh, what is important right now? Two things that people need to focus on. There's always something in, in your list of a thousand things to do. What, what are the main issues? And then who must do what, which is an action list, and who's going to be responsible for what? So creating clarity. Then the other thing he talks about is over-communicating clarity. And we talked about that within the boundaries. You have to repeat over and over what you're doing, what you understand that you're doing, and who should be doing what. And then the reinforcing clarity part of uh, the chapters in his book uh, are extended to the culture and the fabric of your organization. So it extends to all other teams and ministries, the clarity of, of what it is your team or your church is doing, and then, of course, to the congregation. Um, pulpit announcements, however you're going to do it in your church. Um, his whole premise is that you cannot be clear enough or communicate enough how important these things are. Position descriptions, really important um, for board chair and all the portfolios for everybody on the team, paid and unpaid staff, and yes, lay leaders and volunteers. Um, in order to make sure that people understand what their expectations are um, and give them freedom within that job once you've told them uh, what to do, each personality will bring how to do it, but I have seen um, 
great success in everybody having a job description and everybody understanding what it is they're supposed to be doing. And then together, what we will do, spiritual discernment as part, clearly as part of a board, their spiritual discernment leading to unified decisions. Um, I know that some churches want to be unanimous, um, and that's not the same as necessarily unified. Unanimous is every single person agrees with that. Um, others are unified, meaning that everybody in that meeting agrees to go a certain direction, even if for whatever reason they may they might have a reservation about that, but trust the larger group. So it doesn't matter which way your church is doing it, but clearly spiritual discernment and vision for the church is part of, um, part of what the board would do. Just take a minute to, this, um, what is the scope and mandate of the team that you're on right now or that you would be talking, thinking about when you're sitting here listening to this webinar? Um, can you name it? Can you name the scope and mandate of your team clearly and exactly? And then, just for another thought, is name two things on, uh, that your team does that it should probably not be doing a wrong focus or sidetracked or you want to avoid issues that is a repetitive habit. Uh, most teams have them, even well-organized teams. They keep talking about things that they probably shouldn't and should go elsewhere. And even removing those one or two, if somebody can call every time, uh, takes, takes a lot um, off their plates and more focus on what they were setting out to do. All right, vibrant meetings, it's not an oxymoron. Um, the, here's some, a list of quick ideas on how to keep your uh, meetings vibrant, active, engaging, and that people want to come to the meetings that, that you lay out. One, pray, pray, pray. What is that? Pray for yourself running the meetings or attending the meetings. Pray for the leader of the meetings. Pray for the atmosphere. Pray that people will be able to remove their thoughts um, and stresses of the day at work with kids, with aging parents. There's so many issues that people bring to every meeting. Um, and Pray that away so that God will clear the slate so that you are able as a team to hear his, his leading. Definitely send out all preparation reading and an agenda with time topics uh, for the attendees and expect them to come prepared for the discussion. So they will have read the meeting. They will have read the readings that you've sent out. I don't know if they're articles or um, some documents or a budget, whatever the particular issue is, and the, the full agenda that they would come knowing what's going to happen. Something that I learned through experience is if you time the things on your agenda, if you put, you know, this one's 15 minutes, this one's 35 minutes, it gives people an understanding of the importance of that particular issue. Grace, mercy, mercy, patience, and forgiveness. Never attend any meetings without those, remembering that people are coming um, with a good heart. If you've chosen the right people, they're coming with a good heart um, and faith but that they may have issues uh, that, that they're bringing in. So just be patient with people. Uh, where you'll meet matters a lot. It creates the atmosphere. Often when people meet in a home, it, um, it dilutes any stress that, that is in sometimes the colder atmospheres of a, you know, an upstairs meeting room with tables. There's just, it matters to how, how people feel about sharing and being vulnerable, uh, the atmosphere that they're in. I would suggest that you try to separate business and visionary or dreaming topics. So, you know, let, I don't know if you meet twice a month. So say you meet twice a month, I would say one meeting is specifically for business and budget and specific church issues and conflicts and things that that team has um, been mandated to deal with. And on the second meeting, you talk about things that are visionary, future strategy, um, larger issues like um, having a, a sister church or planting a church, things that are sort of um, different than the daily running or the, or the uh, daily issues of, of that particular team. It helps a lot. Summarize updates uh, to highlights only. So let's say you have a team of six people and they each have a portfolio and one's got um, children's ministries and one has the budget and one has um, another ministry in the church or a project that you're working on. The whole idea with these job descriptions is that you'll have these people going with, they'll have a job description, understand what they're supposed to do, have the authority and the respect to go do it, and when they come to the meeting, they're not going over every single detail. They're summarizing those updates, having already had the trust and dealt with the problems in their own time 
and when they're dealing with these other teams and giving you the highlights. The other, uh, last but not least, is keeping to the time allotted in any meeting that you're doing. It shows great respect. It also uh, creates um, trust and people are not fearful to come to your particular meeting uh, because they know that you, you respect their time and that you'll keep, uh, keep them on time and get them out of the meeting on time. So those are the four main topics. Now what? Um, I say take the Nike approach and just do it. Um, look at the things that we've been talking about today. Take a couple of examples back to your group. Start practicing with some of them. Write job descriptions or write a covenant. Uh, we can help you with all of that. Um, a few excellent resources that I've referred to today I want you to know. One is Schizero's Emotional Health Series, the Emotionally Healthy Church. That's where the diagram came from. Osborne's Sticky Teams um, is all about creating a healthy team. Lencioni is the Advantage. It's a secular book um, that is an excellent, excellent resource. And then Peacemakers, which we still have to get the um, author for it unless uh, Mike has done that, is about healthy conflict resolution. It's a, it, there's a book and a pamphlet and a video series for that. We did. Ken the Sandy. Other thing is there's, oh, Sorry. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> no, that's excellent. Everybody, Ken Sandy for Peacemakers. Um, last but not least is best practice consulting and coaching. Uh, it's a good idea if your team is struggling with this or you don't have someone on your team uh, to, it, to whom this comes easily. There's a lot of resources out there. Vision New England is one of them to help you get started to sort of for, formulate a plan on how you would uh, do these things, have vibrant meetings and interact and know what you should and shouldn't be focusing on. Uh, they can also help with the whole process. There's a lot of um, resources out there for that. And also someone to evaluate periodically, how are we actually doing on these particular issues? So that wraps up my part of the, um, the webinar. And are there any other questions? Good stuff, Danielle. Thank you so much. We do have one quick question. Um, the, what do you? What are your suggestions? This is a really tricky question, and one I actually lived through um, as a board member. Uh, what are your suggestions as a, a board member who maybe the leader um, could benefit from something of, of this the nature of this kind of thinking about it, but is kind of reticent to do that? Maybe um, kind of doesn't want to implement change, maybe on, not unlike a family member who doesn't want to see change. <laughs> Understood <laughs> fully and completely. Um, I, I, I've been there, so I understand that. One great way to do that is to suggest, it's easy to suggest, um, like I said before, to separate meetings. That's an easy thing to do, especially if you're running the meetings. You can say this is going to be a business meeting and the next one's going to be um, the visioning meeting. So during that time, say we're actually going to read a book together and pick one of these books, pick a resource so it's not you speaking, it's not you the authority speaking, so you're not, you don't need to be reticent. You're saying, you know what, let's see if we can do this better. I don't know. Let's explore it together. Is a nice lead-in and then people will have opinions and ideas and hopefully it goes from there. Mm, great suggestion. Um, I had a quick question, not seeing, oh, I had a couple other ones, but I'll ask mine really quick. Um, <laughs> Boy, there was a lot of detail here, a lot of information. Um, can, I'm sure people could get information overload from it. What do you, I mean, if you could just tie it down to two or three quick applications, what are, what are kind of those first steps do you think a board uh, should take to kind of move forward? First and foremost, unequivocally, is to have some kind of understanding, through a covenant if you want, of how you will be. What you will do is later and less important. I know that sounds absolutely backwards. Mm -hmm. But decide how you will function as a healthy team. And there's many, as I said, there's many resources out there in terms of covenant and um, ways that people agree to interact with each other. That will cut out 50% of wasted time on your team. So right away, you're simply uh, more effective as a team on the doing part. So the first thing I would do is make sure that everybody understands how to interact as a team. And then functional boundaries. Functional yeah. boundaries are very important. What, what does this team do? Are, are we approving? Are we guiding? Are we t caring about cracks in the sidewalk? Or, or are we talking about where our church is 10 years? It's really important to differentiate these things. 
nothing's wrong with the sidewalk and nothing's wrong with where the church will be, mm. but that the team itself understands where its mandate and scope is is really important. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Matt Gray just has a quick question. If you could just um, mention again those six things that clarify purpose. I know oh, the clarity. Mentioned... Yeah, the clarity Didn't of purpose. Mentioni? Yes. Okay, sorry. Hold on. I will find Throwing that. Throw your curveball there. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, the six questions um, are, why do we exist? How do we behave? What do we do? These are the things we've just talked about. How will we succeed? What is our strategy to get to um, where we want to go? What is important right now? Which really is just a priority list. So if you have 27 things to do, he's saying focus on the top two for this particular time. That time could be one year or a month, but the idea is what is important right now and determine what right now means. And then the last is who must do what. Important, that's job descriptions. It's, it's the secular view of everything we talked about in six questions. They're really nice and succinct, actually. It's a great book. Thanks. One last question. Uh, this is a really good question, actually. Not like the others weren't. Uh, is, <laughs> is, sorry. Is getting personal and sharing spiritual growth issues off topic for board meetings, or should that be a portion of another meeting or individually? What is, what is your... Can experience. you say the question, getting spiritual, getting what? Is getting spiritual or sharing spiritual growth questions um, getting a little too personal for a board meeting? Should that be done off topic? Or have you found that it grows boards closer together as they talk about spiritual needs and, and growth issues? I can only do this from personal experience. Mm -hmm. And the small group that we discussed during the webinar, having uh, – the, the group decide on a small group meeting that has nothing to do with the business of what their functioning, of what their function is. Uh, we share testimony. We definitely do talk about sp spiritual dry periods. Um, I would certainly want my board, who, uh, who because we've done such a good job at vetting who they are, are spiritually mature and would support me in that. And spiritual um, uh, periods of dryness, periods of struggle, struggle with your children um, in terms of faith, uh, we've shared it all. There's mm. nothing that we have um, left uncovered that someone wanted to share. I found it very effective in terms mm. of trust. Yeah, right. Interesting. That's just my experience. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, one last quick question uh, comes from your <laughs> comes from your son, Ashley Danielle. Oh, great. <laughs> what would you recommend if a board has already made a covenant but has not been able to follow up with the covenant, or maybe it's it's there but they're not really following it? Ah, uh, that's actually a really good question. <laughs> um, I would revisit it with the board. Also, if, if there is trouble, because often covenants come to you after, and you just show up with it, so you haven't bought into it. If this is an issue on your particular team, you might want to revisit, spend a meeting, these things are worth it, spend a meeting writing it together and get everybody in that room to agree to what is on this covenant. And why not? If there's issues that people aren't following and won't follow, why not? What is the negative to that? Mm, I think we're Ryan. I think we're losing your audio, unfortunately. But it was uh, perfect time, perfect timing, Ashley. Um, unfortunately, we've kind of run out of time. But I wanted to make sure everyone had um, Danielle's contact information. She's graciously. Um, offered to be available if you had any questions and you wanted to email those or call her, feel free to do that. Uh, she is a consultant for Vision New England and does some leadership consulting for churches, so I'm sure she would love to answer any questions you might have offline, or maybe uh, it was more of a sensitive nature that you wanted to be specific. Uh, we do thank you, everyone, for attending today. It was a fantastic uh, uh, topic. I think with the nature of the questions, clearly, uh, was one that was very much uh, appropriate to where a lot of churches are today. Um, so before we close, I just wanted to uh, pray real fast with everyone and just, again, thank Danielle for all her time and, and really for her heart to see churches grow in New England. Father God, we just we thank you so much, Lord, for what you're doing in New England. We thank you for every church represented here, Lord, who wants to see your kingdom come and, and Lord, wants to be tangible and relevant uh, in their community to share the hope and the love of Christ that we have. And, and Lord, we do pray that you would help 
uh, each and every church represented that they would make um, have those discussions that might be difficult in nature, but maybe have those those discussions that need to occur. And and Lord, we just pray for every board now represented here that you would be at the center of everything that they do. And Lord, that uh, our hope and love that we have in you would just permeate everything that we do. Uh, we do thank you so much for what you're doing in New England and the fact that hearts and minds are being changed. Uh, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank Amen. you. Amen. Amen. Thank you for attending, everyone, and have a great day. And hopefully we'll see you next month. Uh, really quick, uh, I just wanted to get this out because the time actually has changed. We're not going the second Thursday uh, next month, not the third, but we're going. Our Pastor uh, Ryan Howell and the VNE president will be talking a little bit on how you can use Easter to leverage growth throughout the year. Uh, we did offer this topic last year. And it was very, very well received, so we're going to offer that again this year, and hopefully you can attend, uh, and please um, uh, feel free to, to ask any questions you might have of Danielle and myself. Thank you very much, and see you next month.